testing for YouTube, testing the audio. Can you guys let me know if you can hear me well? Testing for YouTube, YouTube audio. Can you guys let me know if you can hear me? Testing audio for YouTube. All right, everyone, welcome. Yeah. Hey guys, we're gonna get started now. You guys can find your seats. All right. All righty. So welcome everybody to our March meeting. My name is Brian Diaz. I am the, uh, the chapter president. It's great to see you all and thank you guys for, uh, for joining us. Good to see your faces live and in person. Um, we do have some folks uh, joining us from YouTube, so they, they're going to be able to attend uh, our meeting virtually. One of the beauty of, uh, of, of having this, uh, this kind of hybrid system that we successfully implemented for the first time last time and seemingly are doing it successfully for, for the second time. So two for two. That's a, that's, that's a good record in my book. Uh, so before we get started with our presentation, we do have some, uh, some announcements. Um, so first and foremost, uh, Native Plant Field Day is right around the corner. It's on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, if you haven't signed up for a field trip, I highly recommend that you do. Uh, we have 14 different field trips in total to different places in the county and a couple of field trips in the Keys. Um, and we are now allowing for sign up to two field trips if you want to check out two, two spots, uh, since we still have plenty of, uh, of openings uh, left for them. Um, we are, we are uh, deactivating the registration link tomorrow. However, if you, if you still want to register after the fact, you can just send us an email directly to our, uh, our chapter email, which is datefmps at gmail.com, and we'll help you with the registration process. Um, next, on Wednesday, April 6th, we have uh, our deadline for the chapter board nominations. Uh, you can also send nominations to the chapter, uh, the chapter email. Uh, open positions are president, vice president, and three directors at large positions, two of them for two-year terms and one of them for a one-year term. Next, on Saturday, April 9th, we have a chapter workday at Everglades National Park, which will run from 9 a.m. to noon. It's a great opportunity to, to, uh, to help out with a restoration project that the chapter's been working on uh, in Everglades National Park for a long time now. Uh, it's going to be in the uh, Ernest F. Coe Visitor Center. Uh, if you're a new volunteer, please contact Patty Fairs 
at fairspl at gmail.com. There's just some preliminary paperwork to sign before you can volunteer. Uh, next, on Saturday, April 16th, we have our next uh, chapter field trip to uh, Austin Hammock Trail in Everglades National Park, which will be led by Lydia Cuny, who is, um, who is our chapter secretary, as well as working as a biologist for, uh, for Fairchild's Tropical Botanic Garden. Uh, it, it is going to be a holiday weekend, so there's Passover and Easter happening that weekend, so there will be free admission to the park, a perk of, of, uh, of going to that field trip. Um, on Tuesday, April 26th, we'll have our April monthly program, uh, and the title of that program will be Conservation of the Miami Blue Butterfly in, in Florida, and it will be delivered by Sarah Steele Cabrera from the University of Florida. Uh, Currently, the plan is to have it just like this, a hybrid meeting where we can have an in-person segment and, uh, and a, a, a virtual segment, although we're constantly keeping watch with COVID, so, uh, so we'll, we'll send out any correspondences if that, if that changes. Um, and then lastly, we have from May 20th to the 22nd, we have the 41st Annual Conference, uh, Florida Native Plant Society Annual Conference, uh, which will be held virtually. Uh, registration is now open. Um, if you are interested in attending that, it's a great way to network and uh, with other uh, botanists or people who just love native plants. Um, and there's always a lot of really good informative talks in uh, in in the conference. Um, I do have a few uh, a few members, a few new members uh, that I would like to uh, to welcome to the to the chapter. Uh, so welcome Tammy Flood and Caitlin Flood Rice, Nam Imbesi. Uh, Ian McNamara and Avra Ackerman, uh, Mixed Greens Incorporated, which uh, have joined on the business level, and Scott Sutherland. Uh, and we have one person who's joined from Key Largo. Welcome to Laura Wells. Uh, if, you're, if you're joining us and you're not a member, I highly encourage you to do so. Your, your, uh, your participation um, uh, really helps us uh, continue with our, with our mission of preserving, uh, conserving, and restoring our native plants and native plant ecosystems. Yeah, Susan. For those of you that are here, yeah, Sonia, she was here. This is Sonia and Sonia Thank you, Susan. And the newsletter has tons more information. If you don't currently receive it, it's a one-stop shop of, of learning a lot more of what's going on uh, with, uh, with not just our organization, but other local organizations that have to do with native plants, uh, restoration and conservation. Um, so just as a, a housekeeping thing, uh, if you have your cell phone with you, just turn it uh, on, on silent, just out of respect for our, for our presenter, um, just so we don't have uh, any, any distractions during. Now, before, uh, before I introduce our presenter, we do have our raffle table with uh, plenty of, of uh, beautiful, beautiful plants here. Steve, did you want to, uh, to present the, uh, the plants? I did. <laughs> that would be very much appreciated. And for you folks joining us on, on YouTube, this will take a few minutes. So we'll, we'll just uh, hang back for a bit and we'll get started with the presentation in a few minutes. It's uh, Phyllanthus pentaphyllus. I'll write it down. Please. And it's it's five petal. Yeah, it's five petal something rather. <laughs> All right, welcome back. It's our second meeting since the uh, the event. Uh, we got some nice selections uh, this this month as well. Some stuff that doesn't always come in. Um, I'll begin uh, on this end. We have a nice small uh, little ensemble. It's a typical native plant collection of more than one species in a pot. So we have uh, the, the tall woody thing is a cocoa plum, Chrysobalanus icaco. 
And this is a native and it actually has edible fruits and the seeds can also be roasted and eaten. It's found in swamps and marshes and also in coastal areas. Uh, this is a, a shrub, but it can be grown as a small tree. It's really wider than tall. We have a lot of selection of scorpion tail, Heliotropium angiospermum. And this has white flowers that the inflorescence or bloom spike curves into a tail that looks like a scorpion's tail, hence the name. Scorpion tail and members of the Baraginaceae in general are really good for attracting pollinators, especially small butterflies. Um, this also has the added bonus for those of us that have our yards overplanted, this will grow in shade. So this, yes, and it will spread in your yard a bit. But everyone always asks me, that's one of my top three questions, what will grow in shade? Well, that's one of the natives that will. Another tree or shrub that'll grow in shade is the bitter bush. And that's this here, the leaves are green, but they'll also be dappled with red, especially in low light conditions. This is a small tree uh, and it's dioecious, which means there's male and females. And they'll have these pendant flowers that hang downward in a spray. And the females, the, the fruits will develop and they're red. So they're very attractive. Uh, this will also grow very well in shade. And like the scorpion tail, this will also spread uh, quite a bit. Only if you have a girl, yeah. Um, we have a nice, I'll come back to, to this pine rockland stuff in a minute. Um, another hammock tree like that picramnia uh, is crabwood, which is this one here, very drought tolerant, grows in hammocks in Dade County in the Keys. Um, it's a, a nice tree that's an evergreen and it can also be used as a screen. Um, we have some plants here that need love. Um, Someone brought in some firebush, which Hemelia patens. And this is a wonderful tree to attract hummingbirds. It has red tubular flowers. It'll also attract butterflies like the zebra longwing and others. Um, it's a large shrub that'll grow up to 15, 20 feet tall and is usually taller than wide. It grows in the, what's that? Fire leaf. Oh yeah, this one has one leaf, so. Um, here's one that has a few more, I suppose. Are you suggesting we should jury our entries, Ami? All right, so we have beautyberry, American beautyberry. Calicarpa is actually Latin for beauty berry. Uh, and it's a species epithet is Americana. So American beautyberry, Calicarpa Americana. This grows in um, upland communities like Pine Rocklands, but it's also in maritime hammocks. Um, very popular tree. It's actually in the mint family. Uh, it's actually been shown, I think there was a paper published that this will repel mosquitoes. Um, the, the flowers are usually purple and the fruit can either be white or purple, depending upon, it's the same species, it's just there's variation. Um, but the more common one is purple. And this one grows in full sun, it does best, but it will tolerate some shade. And you can cut it back every now and then because um, it's adapted somewhat to fire. So we have some other, goodness gracious, a big pot of lots of little seedlings of Jamaican dogwood, which uh, is not as fun as it used to be. Its name changed from Capra sinophallophora to Quadrella jamesensis. And Sinophallophora is Latin for bearing a dog's penis. So it's not as fun, but the other native caper that's here, the limber caper, they changed the name from Capris flexuosa to Sinophalla flexuosa. So just to confuse us botanists. We have another hammock tree here. This is a wild lime. This is the larval host plant for one of our native butterflies, I think our largest one, which is the giant swallowtail. And uh, this is like the bitter bush. Wild lime is also dioecious. There are male and female. The butterfly doesn't care. Uh, it'll lay its eggs on either one. 
We have another hammock species. This here is a strangler fig, Ficus aurea, which is probably the best wildlife plant you could put in your yard. Uh, figs fruit year round. And um, it's a host plant for the ruddy dagger wing. And if, if you ever hang out with birders, they know to look for birds in the figs because that's where you get the diversity. It's figs and oaks. So this is a native ficus. And it is a big tree, though. You'd want to have space for it. Um, but uh, there it is. Um, oh, we do have the other, the uh, limber caper, which is now Sinophala flexuosa. And this will also tolerate some shade. It's also somewhat salt tolerant. It'll grow in coastal areas. So will the other caper. We have another hammock species, which is this one here is a Florida Keys black bead. And uh, this is a beautiful when it blooms. The blooms only last a couple days and they're quite fragrant. But when it blooms, it has these big uh, fireworks displays of flowers. And there's a pink one and a white one or kind of a creamy yellow one. They're both the same species and they will get full of pollinators when they bloom. The whole tree will be pink. Um, okay, let's look at some of the, uh, here's another coastal plant here, which is the Florida necklace pod, Sephora tomentosa variety truncata. This has a spray of yellow tubular flowers, which are visited by hummingbirds, such as the ruby throated hummingbird. And this is a small tree or a large shrub that can get about eight to 10 feet tall in your yard. There's another doppelganger of this that has really, really fuzzy leaves which is considered to be not native, depending upon who you talk to. And that's variety Occidentalis, which is native to Texas and other parts of the Caribbean as, and, and, and the Caribbean. All right, I'm gonna come back over here because we got a special little selection here of some pine rockland plants. We have these beautiful little pinklets, which is a member of the Acanthaceae. It's a lovely little wildflower and it grows in full sun. We have a, a host plant, the Bahama Cinna or Bahama Cassia, and that's a host plant for at least three different sulfur butterflies, including the uh, really common cloudless sulfur, but also the orange barred sulfur, and I think the sleepy orange. And then we have a, a little mixture pot here. We have our native wild basil, which is a state endangered herb. And then next to it, we have Chapman's goldenrod, uh, which both of them are found in Pinelands and uh, wonderful additions to your yard. The wild basil is as fragrant as basil, but it doesn't have the same culinary aptitude as its cousin. Um, a few plants I walked by also, we have a must for every yard is corky stem passion vine. This is a host plant to our state butterfly I mentioned earlier, the zebra longwing, which likes that fire bush, but it's also a host plant to the Julia longwing and the Gulf fritillary. Uh, and we also have next to it a kind of a, a vining herb or, or can get almost shrub-like as far as the size of it. This is Carolina aster or climbing aster, Cynthia trichum carolinianum. We have our state wildflower here, Coreopsis leavenworthii, also known as tick seed. And that's an annual, has a real pretty yellow flower with a brown center uh, and you may want to collect the seed when it's done fruiting because the plant's going to die. It's an annual. We have again, one of my lawn weed favorites is the, the native common violet uh, here, which is a host plant for the Gulf fritillary and provides lovely flowers in the winter. Uh, we have a, another wildflower that we're a little bit south of its range here. This is uh, brown eyed Susan, Rudbeckia herda. The leaves are very rough or scabrous is the 10 cent word for that. And this is a wildflower you find in short hydroperiod wetlands and pine flatwoods. And then we also have another pine rockland species, another species of aster, uh, which is now in the genus Cynthia trichum. This is clasping aster, real pretty pine rockland species, but it also grows up north in sand hill and scrub communities. And I'll leave off. Um, I'll mention this. We have Phyllanthus pentaphyllus, which is really, if you're a really big plant enthusiast, you'd put this in your yard because it doesn't have any redeeming qualities. 
other than being endemic and one of the plants native to pine rocklands. Uh, it will provide seeds that doves will eat, uh, but think of anything else. And then finally, if you, if you have a moist area or you live on a canal, we have two selections of a giant leather fern, which is a crosticum denea folium. And these get huge. So you'd wanna you know, have some space at least 12 feet. I've seen them have fronds that are eight feet long at least. So, um, or you have to trim it up. So if you have a pond or a water feature like that, or you live on a bank of canal or on a lake, it'd be good for that. So that is our selection that I've talked about tonight. If we have a program coming up, I'm gonna give it back to Brian. Hello, everyone. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm a little nervous. Um, I haven't given this presentation before, um, but it's very important and it's going to, you know, it might be a little uncomfortable to talk about some of the things, but um, these are real issues that are especially important for all of us, not only being uh, Floridians, but also citizens of Miami Dade County. Um, so we're going to dive into it. Clicker, I don't think, is working. Frozen? Oh no. <laughs> there we go. So um, the objectives of this talk today are going to be to understand the importance of water conservation in Florida, which I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys already have a grasp on it. Um, we're also going to gain insight on the current socio-economic impacts of water-related issues in Miami-Dade County. And um, we're also going to learn how you can combat some of these issues in your own home. So we're going to bring the fight directly to you guys in your own home. So hopefully we can give you education on how to do that. You want me to just tell you when to go on or? I think it just might be lag. Oh, really? The changes. Yeah. Oh, you want So I'll just start, I guess, by talking while he's working on these technical difficulties about what we do. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with the Extension Office, it's um, the University of Florida's premier extension program. Um, basically what we do, since US, University of Florida is such a big research school, they lead the uh, nation in uh, research or one of the leading uh, research universities, I should say. Um, but basically extension is our job to take the new research coming out being released by the University of Florida and literally extend it to the community. So that's my job. Um, I work with the urban horticulture. Um, some of you may be familiar with my coworker, Barbara McAdams. She's also a member of the Florida Native Plant Society Day Chapter. Um, so I, I work with her doing um, pollinator conservation, South Florida plant, native plant things, um, you know, rain water conservation, all these kinds of cool programs that we have. We'll talk about all those. But basically, so why is water conservation so important in Miami-Dade County? Well, it's because water is life, simply put. 
Um, I like to include this little photo when I do, con I mean, talks about water conservation because it just shows you that water is really all around us, right? I mean, it's above our head, it's right beneath our feet. It's that way, that way, that way, that way. So I like to, I like to just um, show this graphic because it shows you, um, you know, not only is it all around us, but it also gives us life. I mean, you can't go obviously without drinking water for more than a couple days. And um, we also have a great, um, you know, economic boost from our water resources like tourism people come to miami for our beaches we have a international port you know people going on cruises and things like that and i mean who doesn't want to come to florida if you don't go see a beach so it's up to us to not only protect these things for our benefit but also for the animals benefit you know it gives us a source of food um, and there's all kinds of really cool intercoastal communities and all kinds of things that it's our duty and our responsibility to protect so we're going to talk about how we can do that today and we're going to look at these big picture issues and these are things like um, climate change right and this is caused by ever since the turn of the industrial revolution um, more and more carbon is being emitted into our atmosphere it's getting trapped in our atmosphere and it's causing a heating effect um, known as um, global warming whether or not you're a naysayer behind global warming uh, and climate change leads to issues such as sea level rise, which is things we're seeing um, in Miami-Dade County every year around the world, really. And um, it's because of issues like with this uh, Thwaites Glacier right here. This is a link to an article from the National Geographic. It's talking about um, the Thwaites Glacier is basically under risk of erosion from above and below, not only the warming waters, but also warming airs on top. So it's basically double trouble for the Thwaites Glacier. And um, this is one of the biggest um, water holding glaciers in the world. And also, if Antarctica alone holds enough ice, uh, stored water and ice to raise the sea level by 200 feet if we're all to go. So um, just a little warning sign there. Also, why is this so important to us? Well, we obviously have a very low lying topography. Um, we're right on the sea level, basically. And the ground water table is basically right at our feet in a lot of places around Miami-Dade County. So um, we have a, a big duty to protect these water resources. Hold on for a second. Awesome. So we're going to first dive into climate change. And um, we see these issues in things like melting uh, glaciers, obviously causing sea level rise, which we already talked about, shifts in weather. So as um, climate change becomes more and more drastic, we're going to see more and more drastic shifts in weather, more frequent and intense heat, um, more waves, more droughts, things like that. And these things are not only going to be more frequent, but they're also going to be more severe. Um, and also warming oceans causes a host of issues like um, harmful algal blooms, red tide, fish kills, and much more. Um, this picture here is a picture from the uh, uh, polar extremes on PBS. And this is just an infographic that shows the, um, the ocean driven uh, reduction of our ice table here. And I believe that's in Antarctica. So these things are drastically dropping back um, at you know, greater and greater rates as uh, climate issues ramp up and I think it might be frozen. Oh, there we go. And one of the biggest issues behind this that's driving this is our dependency on energy, right? Um, and it's not just driving around in the cars, it's really just capitalism in general. Um, you know, I, I like I have a article here about, um, you know, SUVs erasing progress from electric cars. I drive an electric car, I have a Nissan Leaf, it's zero emissions. Um, but also it's not just um, driving cars, it's, it's, it's driving our economy, you know, you have to, you, have to process, you get to get materials from the earth that requires a lot of raw materials. Um, they emit a lot of carbon into the, into the atmosphere. Then that has to be processed, which does more damage, causes more pollution. These um, materials then are made into you know, phones or food or whatever it may be, packaging. And then these things are shipped across the world in certain cases. So even more transport and more gasoline, more fossil fuels being burned. So it's really just an endless supply of energy dependency. And um, until we can break our energy dependency, the climate issues are just going to ramp up and get worse. And um, it, it's not, it's, it doesn't really help when you're, you know, your governing bodies don't, don't support the um, changes that we want to see, right? We want to see climate change be remedied and these issues to go away. But um, just recently in the past couple of years, we've been seeing a lot of environmental rollbacks from our government especially under the Trump administration, we saw a lot of um, these environmental rollbacks. And this is what this article is from. And uh, you can't see the source there, but that's, I believe, from um, uh, 
uh, I forget the school. Yeah, New York Times, sorry. And a Harvard, I believe, based study or Columbia study or something like that. Oh, awesome. <laughs> so this is, these are just some little facts I got from the EPA, um, just to show you kind of the intensity of, of what our human-based activities are doing to the planet. 45% uh, increase of the total warming effect of greenhouse gases added to the Earth's atmosphere. So not only are we adding more and more of these gases, but also the heating effect of these gases is increasing. Also, we have um, a 31% of amount increased annual average snow and ice melt from glaciers in the past 15 years. So not only are we having these issues with warming in the, um, in the world, but now they're causing our glaciers to melt at a faster, more rampant rate, which we touched on earlier. And this is just a figure to show you, this is also from the EPA, to show you the yearly absolute sea level rise. This is averaged over all of the world's water bodies and oceans. And um, this is actually faster, two times faster than the historic average of looking from 1880 all the way to 2013. And this study was done from 93 to 2013. So I'm sure that number has probably only increased since then. So I'll, I'll, as you can see, sea levels rising faster ever now than it has before. Um, so issues with sea level rise in Miami-Dade County, that's why we're here, right? Well, obviously the number one issue is flooding and that really causes all these other issues that you see here today. Um, saltwater intrusion, I'm sure you know what saltwater intrusion is. We'll talk more about it. Um, septic failure is a big one. And we'll talk about that as well. And climate gentrification is a new socioeconomic um, issue in Miami-Dade County that a lot of people have never heard of. It's a new term um, and it's very interesting. Um, they did a study on it and we'll look at that as well. So issues with flooding, well, obviously there's a huge socioeconomic impact. You know, there's loss of life, there's damage to property, um, all kinds of horrible things that come about with social, I mean, with, um, with flooding. So. There's also water pollution, you know, these, this water gets up on our roadways, picks up that oil, fertilizer, pesticides, all those nasty things, um, chemicals, all these kinds of nasty things, and it carries them out into the ocean, and, and it, it, it pollutes our water bodies, and we'll look at some of the issues um, associated with that. And also it causes erosion. My, uh, Florida is very prone to erosion. We have very porous soils, um, and we're basically sitting on top of lime rock, which is very porous and um, pretty weak. So, and this is just looking at the Miami-Dade County flood maps. You can access these on the Miami-Dade County website. And this is just a close up of Miami Beach, pretty much just a giant flood plain, right? So, and um, if you take a step further back, you can see the Everglades here. And um, I mean, Miami-Dade is basically just sitting on a giant swamp, more or less. So, flooding is very, it's very prone to flooding, is what I'm saying here. And um, it's led us to create these Miami-Dade County storm surge planning zones. And basically these are areas where, um, where the, the flooding is, 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 very, is very prone to flooding. And um, these are basically, these help us um, dictate like, you know, evacuation routes and plan accordingly for a flooding event. So I encourage everyone to go look up uh, the Miami-Dade County storm surge planning zones, you know, just be prepared in the event of a flood in case one does happen. And flooding leads to a host of issues, which we're now we're gonna start getting into. The first one being saltwater intrusion. And this is basically when um, there's not enough freshwater pressure to keep the saltwater out um, from invading our freshwater aquifer. So basically we have a freshwater aquifer beneath our feet and it's enclosed by a very, um, very porous layer of limestone. And basically due to the nature of water, one of them has a lot of salts in it, one of them doesn't. So there's a difference of um, viscosity is there, difference of pressures causes the fresh water to um, be able to keep the salt water from invading it. But um, issues with overdrawing people, taking up water from the aquifer has led for, has allowed this salt water to um, slowly invade our fresh water wells. I don't know if any of you have had issues with this yet, but um, as more and more people move to Miami-Dade County, these issues are only gonna be amplified. So salt water intrusion is a huge issue. And once these fresh water wells become invaded by salt water, it's very, very impossible. I mean, very, very hard, if not impossible to um, undo that. So we gotta protect those while, it, while we have them. And uh, probably the biggest issue associated with um, sea level rise here in Miami-Dade County, a rising water, level, uh, water table level is septic failure. And basically um, increased rain, rainwater events um, has basically put a huge threat onto um, Miami-Dade County septic systems. And um, an estimate done in a recent study um, suggest, 
suggests that 64% of septic properties right now in Miami-Dade County will be at risk of failing or periodically failing um, by 2040 due to sea level rise. So what does it mean when a septic tank is failing? Well, essentially a septic tank is an underground concrete box that is meant to cycle, I mean, filter out wastewater um, down into the soil below. And the idea is for the soil to be unsaturated, which means it's not coming into contact with the groundwater. So old recommendations were about a foot of unsaturated soil. New recommendations are about two feet of unsaturated soil beneath that septic tank for um, proper, proper uh, siphoning out of nutrients and stuff like that. So we're not loading nutrients into our water bodies, nitrogen being the main one. Um, so as sea level rises, we see now where we have all this unsaturated soil beneath these septic tanks, um, sea level rises. Some of these septic tanks are sitting in submerged water, which is a failed system. Basically, there's no, it's pumping wastewater directly into our, into our groundwater at that point. We also have a compromised system, which is there's not enough unsaturated soil beneath these septic tanks for proper nutrient um, loss before it gets into our, our groundwater. And then, um, as you can see, the, the varying levels of elevation affect which septic tanks are at risk and which ones are not. Where I'm from in Central Florida, you know, you can drill down 30 feet in certain cases before you reach the groundwater. But here in Miami-Dade County, it becomes a bigger issue. So um, it's a huge, a huge problem if we're going to have 64% of properties, septic properties at risk. And guess what? They're still installing septic tanks all over Miami-Dade County. There's no real incentive to hook them up with the sewer line, or in some cases, there's not even an option to hook them up with the sewer line. Um, so this is a problem that Miami-Dade County is going to have to face. They've been very transparent about how expensive it's going to be. Estimates put it at about $3.3 billion to convert these systems over to um, sewer. And it's going to be expensive. They have gotten um, some grants and they're working on getting more to help cover the costs in you know, lower income areas like Little Haiti and stuff like that. We've seen issues with um, with septic tanks failing and stuff like that. It's very prone to flooding. So yeah, like I said, about $3.3 billion estimated to rip out and connect. And in Pinecrest, in certain cases, I, I use this Pinecrest example, it could cost as much as 50,000 per home because they have to run a new sewer line. So lots of, uh, lots of money involved there, but you know, it's for the environment, it's, I, I see it's necessary. Um, one of the biggest issues we have is um, human nitrogen loading. And this is one of the big causes of that. <clears throat> so now we're gonna talk about landfills. This is another issue with, with water, especially here in Miami-Dade County. We have a lot of landfills that are on heavily compromised areas. They're right next to um, you know, water bodies, streams, lakes and stuff like that, right on top of the, um, the water table, basically. So as you know, trash goes to landfills, obviously all trash goes to landfills. Um, hopefully you're composting and recycling at home because 90% of what we've thrown away could have actually been recycled or composted. But um, landfills are a huge source of leachate, which are basically like toxic water pretty much from water percolating through this trash mountain more or less. And also um, there are huge, um, huge sources of greenhouse gases like methane being the most harmful greenhouse gas in the world, as well as um, carbon dioxide. So huge sources of greenhouse gases um, associated with landfills. So I always like to do, I actually stole this from a, a presentation I do for kids just to kind of put it in perspective. If we've got 2.2, I mean, 2.7 million people in Miami County as of 2019, the, the global average is um, one person uses about two kilograms of trash per day on average. So you multiply that by uh, 2.7 million people in Miami-Dade County, you get about 5.4 million kilograms per day in Miami-Dade County. Multiply that times 365 days in a year, we've got about one, um, almost 2 million grams, which is about 5 million pounds every year of trash in Miami-Dade County. And if we're keeping 90% of that out of the landfill, then we're doing a great service to our environment. Also, um, it, I, I have another slide that I didn't include on here, but um, if, you're, if you're composting, instead of throwing things away, like your green table scraps, your yard clippings, if you're composting those things, they're able to break down in the presence of oxygen because you'll be turning your compost pile. And when you break down things in the presence of oxygen, methane gas is um, not produced at all. So actually, if you're composting, you're not making methane, whereas if you're throwing these green scraps into our landfill, they break down without the presence of oxygen, which causes um, methane and carbon dioxide both to be produced. So it's chemically proven that it's dangerous to throw these kinds of things in the landfill. On top of 
um, you know, hazardous waste like TV screens and paints and oils and things like that. I mean, imagine, um, I mean, there's arsenic and lead in some of these electronics that we use, like computer monitors and things like that. You don't want that getting in our groundwater, right? It can be deadly. And um, all these things leaching in our groundwater is known as leachate. Leachate comes from a landfill. So that's what we're trying to prevent in the topic of water conservation. Um, another plague of standing water, as we all know, being residents of Florida are mosquitoes. And here in South Florida, we have all kinds of nasty um, mosquito borne diseases like uh, West Nile virus, cephalitis, all kinds of nasty things. Um, especially down in Monroe County, we see things um, like uh, dengue fever and things like that. So uh, globally, mosquitoes are the most deadly insect they're responsible for over 1 million human deaths every year so crazy figure there so we always promote you people to give re remove standing water because you know that's gonna allow insects to breed and i can we're gonna go over a few ways you can do that at your home if you don't have um you know maybe you you can't do some of the things we talk about well they do have mosquito dunks these are um, bpa i believe it is the ingredient in here the chemical in here that basically interrupts the mosquitoes breeding process, doesn't allow the larvae to um, fully form. And there's also biological controls, you know, if you don't wanna go with the chemical route, there's actually fish and things like that that, um, that eat mosquito larvae. So you can look into those as well. So those are just a few tips to, um, you know, re help remove standing water, always go around and check, use the mosquito dunks where necessary, use wire mesh holes on open areas that you can't really empty out on a, on a regular basis. Basically things that are smaller than an adult mosquito help keep mosquitoes out. So now we're gonna look at a new topic, a new socioeconomic issue known as climate gentrification. And this is very interesting um, study that was done by PBS. And uh, I encourage everyone to go check this out. It's from the uh, Peril and Promise um, section on PBS. And basically they did a study and so historically, it's kind of a story time a little bit. Historically, you know, um, the nice high end, got to have it uh, properties in Miami Dade County are the ones by water, right? Runs out by the ocean, by the canals, by the bay, places like that. And obviously, these are the places that have the lowest elevation comparatively to um, comparatively in Miami Dade County. So the high, lowest elevation, highest property value. Well, now is these new um, climate estimates are coming out surrounding um, sea level rise in Miami-Dade County. A lot of these places are gonna be at risk. So now we're seeing spikes in the property values of Miami-Dade's highest elevated um, locations, which are where historically um, black and brown communities have been forced to live because it's the only place they could afford to live. So now we're seeing issues where um, basically um, these areas that are historically black and brown communities like Little Haiti, and places like that are being gentrified and the um, rate, rates are going through the roof to where the native peoples of these communities cannot afford them. So it's another issue surrounding um, climate. It kind of it's kind of how climate, property values and um, and climate change, I guess, all intersect affordable housing. That's what I said there. Immigration as well, because, you know, these are immigrant communities that have either been forced to move here or moved here for the will of the good of their own family. And now they're, they're unable to live in these areas, which is pretty sad. And I, I think uh, affordable housing needs to be protected, especially here in Miami. This is a really interesting video. Um, usually I provide the video, but um, I didn't know if we'd have internet access here or not. But basically this just shows how um, it, it demonstrates non-point source pollution, which is what we are basically what, when it comes to how we can reduce how we can help um, reduce our water pollution at home. This is how we're going to do is by reducing non-point source pollution. And basically this little duckies here, it just shows how things in your landscape, um, if they were, if, if pollution in your landscape was a rubber ducky, um, it'd be obviously more visible. You could see where your pollution was going to, and uh, maybe it would help people visualize the impact they have on the environment. So basically it shows, um, you know, oil dripping from a car turning into a rubber ducky, pesticides washing off the landscape being a rubber ducky, and then it all goes to our storm drains, which goes out to our bodies of water. So these are all basically water soluble nutrients in the in the terms of fertilizers and things like that. These nutrients dissolve in this water, they're carried away by it, and these nutrients end up in our major bodies of water, and they um, like to suck up that free oxygen and cause problems like fish kills. Um, so that's the major source of non-point source pollution 
is um, stormwater runoff. So if those of you, if anyone doesn't know what non-point source pollution is, basically, um, if you look at Turkey Creek power point down there on the bay, I can point at that smokestacks coming up. That's the source of pollution. Non-point source pollution would be like the neighborhood. I mean, the village of Pinecrest or the village of Palmetto Bay. You know, if you can't just point at one house in particular and say that's a point, a source of pollution, but it's the culmination of all those houses that are be, that are polluting our our um, waterways. And the main source of that is stormwater runoff. So we're going to look at how we can reduce that. Because if we do stormwater runoff, we'll reduce things like harmful algal blooms. And basically these are overgrowth of algae and water. Um, I, I mentioned how nutrients and fertilizers and things like that are water soluble. So they dissolve in water, they're washed away by it if they're not being percolated out into the environment and they end up in our bodies of water. And algae is basically just like a plant. It wants light, it wants nutrients and it wants water. So when these things get up in our oceans, it's basically in the perfect environment because it's nice and hot out there now because of ocean warming. And there's plenty of nutrients out there in our Biscayne Bay because it's just being funneled from places like um, these local areas and homeowners associations and things like that, fertilizing their grass lawns, which is really, really sad. When they could have some beautiful native plants like what you guys have instead of that grass lawn, right? So um, these al algal blooms, they basically, the harmful algal blooms, they release toxins when they bloom, which kill the fish and um, hurt the local environments and also the local economies. But also algal blooms don't have to be a harmful algal bloom to, to do damage. Like just a normal algal bloom um, can, you know, shade out the seagrass, so seagrass can't grow. So actually I just read an um, article just recently, um, sea cows, AKA manatees, um, witnessed a record breaking number of deaths in Florida last year from starvation. 70% um, increase, I believe was the number in manatee deaths from last year because they can't eat, they have no food, that the algae is shading out their food and seagrass can't grow and they can't eat. And it's just really sad. So I always like to put that in perspective, even though it's sad, but everyone wants to save the manatees, hopefully, right? So um, also another study I just uh, read up on was a study actually released by the University of Florida that says that these stormwater retention ponds that Florida is so crazy about building actually emit more carbon than they store. So we're building these things all over the place to capture this um, rainwater and let it, you know, siphon out into the environment. But actually, these things are um, increasing the amount of carbon in our atmosphere. So um, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program is uh, something I help oversee here in South Florida. And uh, I like to call this my contractually obligated statement. It's the state of Florida's premier extension program promoting sustainable alternatives to conventional landscaping by providing guidance on low impact, environmentally friendly, science-based practices using less water and reducing pollutant loads into our water bodies. So basically it's all around reducing non-point source pollution. And it's founded on these nine principles and we're gonna to quickly touch on them. But the number one principle is I think the cornerstone of our program. And this is something you guys should know all about being Florida Native Plant Society is uh, right plant, right place, right? Um, you have to consider things like mature size, watering needs and site conditions. I'm not gonna go plant, you know, uh, drought tolerant plants in the same watering zone as I have my grass because your grass is always gonna need way more water, way more nutrients, things like that to thrive. Um, so, you know, maintain planting beds. Don't plant things too close to the structure of your home if they're gonna get huge because you're gonna have to keep cutting the limbs back. Like I see people all the time, they have a live oak tree five feet from their house, right? And half the tree's been methodically sawed off so it won't grow over the roof of the house. Well, you're continually opening up diseases on this tree, just like a cut on a human, you open up that disease, you wanna put some Neosporin and a Band-Aid on that, right? Well, trees don't really have Neosporin or Band-Aids, so we can help reduce the amount of stress we're putting on them by considering their mature size. Watering efficiently, we'll talk all about that, don't worry about that. Fertilizing appropriately, this one kind of goes hand in hand with another one, so I'll tie them in now, which is uh, managing yard pests responsibly. At um, UF IFAS, we have free diagnostic services, and actually my background, what I graduated from the University of Florida in is plant diagnostics. So I, I have a background in turf diseases, um, fungal, bacterial, viral, as, and we also have a source of, I mean, a host of resources we can reach out to if you ever have an insect or you think you have a deficiency, or, you know, some people think they have deficiencies or they think they have an insect and the whole time it's a fungal disease and they're dumping fertilizers on it, they're dumping pesticides, and this all ends up as runoff because they don't know what the real issue is. So 
send, send, send us your samples and we'd love to check them out. And honestly, that's my favorite part of my job is to look under the microscope at the samples. Mulching helps you reduce the amount you water. So we recommend maintaining two feet, of, I mean, not two feet, two inches of mulch, sorry, around um, plants, you know, not volcano mulching because that compromises the, um, the dermis of the plant. Attracting wildlife, obviously we got some amazing host plants over here. Um, so attracting wildlife, get them into your home. They, they help, um, you know, they're basically, I call them the Charles Darwins of the world, right? They, they facilitate evolution and they give us food. I, I believe the figure is 90% of our diet of fats and oils comes from a plant pollinated by an insect. So, or, or a pollinator rather, not an insect per se. Uh, managing our pest responsibly, we talked about that. Recycling yard waste, we talked about that a little bit in the landfill section. You can do that by composting. And I'll just like to say this as well, whenever I talk about composting, you know, if whether you do your landscaping or you have someone come out and do it for you, you know, these crews, they come out, they cut, mow, they blow, they carry your yard waste away. Well, you're literally carrying nutrients away from your landscape that was harvested right there from your soil. So you're going to reduce the amount you have to fertilize and amend that soil if you're recycling your yard waste, something I like to call nutrient recycling. Um, reducing stormwater runoff, we'll talk more about that, and protecting the waterfront are two of the main, very important um, uh, principles we have to help maintain our water quality. So uh, for protecting the waterfront, we maintain, we recommend maintaining a 10 foot or 20 foot buffer zone, depending on your land availability. Um, and basically this is a planted area with, you know, you can plant some attractive looking plants there that don't need to be maintained. They don't need fertilizer. They don't need pesticides and they like to get their feet wet. So if these things do wash off in these areas, they can percolate through these deeply rooted, you know, wet roots and um, hopefully not end up in our water bodies so much. So um, we can maintain this maintenance free zone and we can reduce our nutrient loading into our bodies of water. And it all goes along with, um, creating a riparian buffer. And this is a zone of vegetated freshwater shoreline. You can see the riparian zone here. And um, you know, the upland area is important as well. You gotta always think about those trees. And um, this is just an excerpt here from the American Littoral Society, which talks about um, the importance of riparian buffers in a landscape. <clears throat> so now you, I'm gonna implore you all to take up the fight at your own home, uh, build a rain garden. If you guys were here last month, I, I believe it was, Barbara did her rain garden presentation. That, was that last month or? Yeah, yeah. Well, recently she's done them. And I've seen it on the um, Florida Native Plant Society YouTube. Um, we've also got uh, rain barrel classes. Um, we'll talk more about that. And like I said, the plant and insect ID help reduce your, um, your nutrient loading into our bodies of water. If you know what you're amending for, you know what, you're, um, you know what the problem is with your plant. And also updating your fixtures. So we're going to look at how you can save water in and outside of your home through programs founded by um, Miami-Dade Water and Sewer that we help oversee. So this is just um, showing you the rain gardens uh, link in on your Florida Native Plant Society YouTube. I actually just watched it in, to help me prepare for this. And um, I mean, Barbara, is, as you all probably know, is, has a background in design. Um, so she has a great eye for you know, creating beautiful areas. And she also is a plant guru and she knows pretty much everything about native plants and uh, native insects and how those two interact. So it's a great, very informative and very um, brief um, presentation. And as you see, these are not necessarily rain gardens because they're you know, large on a larger scale, but um, you can see that these can be very attractive and they can be very large. So if you have a small area, maybe a depressed zone in your landscape, you wanna help capture some of the rainwater and soak it up, then um, I recommend checking out that video. And also check out the Institute for Regional Conservation if you don't already use that as a tool. Um, there's a great tool on here called the Natives for Your Neighborhood. It's basically just a link you can click on the website and um, it can show you over 2,500 plants found in our South Florida um, plant communities. And um, I'll just show you a little screenshot I took from it. You can literally go in and search with your zip code and you can get a whole plant list or you can, you can um, make your search criteria based on the type of habitat. So you can look at all the habitats that would uh, be sufficient for your zip code and um, maybe work on making one of those habitats. Like if you have a pine, you wanna make a pine rockland. Um, I'm always a big uh, advocator for pine rocklands. I have another talk I do that talks about them. So it's important to know what you can plant and what's native to your area. So native street neighborhood is a great way to do that. Rain barrel workshops, um, these are, basically our bread and butter of our program. They help us with funding and things like that. 
were funded by the water and sewer department um, as part of the water use efficiency program. And basically uh, our rain barrel programs offer uh, residents of Miami-Dade County access to low cost uh, refurbished recycled um, rain barrels that are 55 gallons food grade. Um, basically for the, for the size and the quality of this barrel, you can't find another rain barrel for that price and the funds that you use go help to support our programs and things like that, help me do things like this. Um, so if you wanna sign up for our rain barrel program, you can either attend for free and just learn about it, see if maybe it's something you'd be interested in, or you can actually opt to purchase a rain barrel through us for $50 plus tax. And I think Eventbrite charges a little bit of a fee, or you can pay with cash if you just wanna pay the 50 plus tax upfront and avoid the like $3 fee on Eventbrite, you can bring us a check. And um, you can actually come and pick up a rain barrel for us and we'll show you how to install it. And um, you can start capturing rainwater to water your, your plants, like your prized orchids. And if the water is not coming off the roof, if you're just harvesting pure rainwater, you can actually use it to um, water edibles as well. As long as it's not being harvested off the roof, doesn't have any chance of coming into contact with fecal matter, things like that. And uh, I like to include this little picture just because it's a little funny thing Barbara put on her slide. Um, you know, if things go south here in South Florida and our sea levels do rise, you can use your rain barrels for other purposes, right? So if you guys have seen Waterworld, um, maybe you can make a little raft and uh, tour South Florida. So I thought you might get a kick out of that. <laughs> um, so we also have an awesome program, which is pretty much responsible for the uh, majority of our water savings, that big figure that Brian told you in the beginning. Um, which is a landscape irrigation rebate program. And this is something that if you haven't heard of it, I encourage you to listen. And maybe if you have a pre-existing in-ground irrigation system to sign up for the program. So basically this is, off, uh, these, this is a rebate offered um, by the Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department to make your outdated, non-efficient watering uh, irrigation system to, to update it. And we'll literally rebate you $500 for the single family homes qualify for $500 um, for five years. So that's $2,500 in rebates um, for all, all these things here that you see, um, including ripping out irrigation and installing drought tolerant plants. Like maybe you want to install a pine rockland, we'll, we'll rebate you for that um, partially. So, um, <clears throat> and these things, not only do you get rebated for them, but these kinds of features actually save you money in the long run as well. So uh, this is a smart timer here. This is basically what the main thing I recommend for the program and the main thing we recommend for the program as a replace your old outdated mechanical timer with a smart timer, basically a mechanical timer. If you're familiar with it, you set it, you set a schedule um, when you want it to come on at what time and what days, and it can be hurricane Irma outside. And if you set the schedule for that time on that day, that's, that's going to come on. And I don't mean to call anyone out, but I drive um, up and down old Cutler sometimes at night on the way back from visiting with my girlfriend's parents and um, Deering estate is, uh, they do this all the time. So I'm, I'm hopefully working with them soon to get their stuff updated. Um, but also we do this for um, large properties as well. So if you have a business or something like that, maybe you have um, a large rental property uh, with more than one single family living on it. Uh, we can qualify you for the large property program, which is a single year program, but you qualify for up to 2850 in rebate. So instead of 2,500 over five years, it's 2850 for one year. So it's a great program, helps people save a bunch of water. And honestly, half of it's behind just setting up this smart timer and people water seven days a week on a grass lawn. And honestly, watering seven days a week on a grass lawn, you're doing more damage than you're doing good. The rebate form, um, you reach out to me, I'll, I'll provide you with some resources at the end. You can sh shoot me an email and it's as simple as, um, I'll send you a, a, our new program application. You can get signed up or maybe send it to someone who you know who has an ink. It has to be pre-existing in-ground irrigation. So we don't support new irrigation being implemented. We only support the retrofitting of existing irrigation. Um, and also I, I have to say, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't, um, you, you, you qualify for a free pre and post inspection if you get into the program, which I mean, it, all you have to do is submit an application, like I said, and um, all, all to be to be um, to meet rebate. Basically, we have to come out and do our pre assessment before you make changes because we like to recommend changes that need to be done. So if you've already done changes, unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to rebate for that. But I mean, um, we can probably get you on the schedule pretty quick and you can be updating your system in a matter of weeks, hopefully. 
So this is all, um, these are all initiatives from the Miami-Dade Water Use Efficiency Program. You can look that up on Google and read all about Miami-Dade's um, water saving initiatives. We'll talk a bit about a few that we haven't already highlighted. And this is another one that um, the Miami-Dade Water and Sewer Department oversees, which is the, uh, the fixture rebate program, I think is what it's called. And basically this is Miami-Dade residents. If they have a house built after, I, I, I think it's 1996, I believe. I think that's on the next slide. Oh, 19, yeah, 1996. Um, then they can qualify for actually um, update their fixtures with water efficient EPA sense certified water sense certified fixtures um, and it's two two uh, two rebates per category so you can get two toilets fifty dollar rebate per toilet two shower heads twenty five dollar rebate per shower head two faucets twenty five dollar rebate per faucet so not only are you getting rebated for a majority of the cost of the item but in the case of the toilet, uh, one water efficient toilet can save you over $4,000 over the course of its lifetime. So there, I don't see a reason why you shouldn't do that. And also I believe that number may be even higher if you're a senior. So senior, there's a senior toilet, water efficient toilet uh, rebate program. And I think the figure is either 100 or $200 rebate per toilet. What's, uh, yeah, probably, unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yeah, use it as a flower pot. I saw one on the side of the road on the way here. <laughs> um, so Miami Dade. Um, so just to look at some more initiatives in Miami Dade County. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation has something called the Resilient Cities Network, formerly known as the um, uh, the Hundred Cities or some Hundred Resilient Cities Network or something like that. And basically, um, this is a conservation program looking at basically creating a network of of um, resilient cities to climate change that are you know adapting to climate change and Miami was selected as one of them and it and as part of getting signed up into this network um, it led to the creation of the chief resilience officer which is now implemented in our local government so that's awesome that we have you know a voice of resilience in the local government maybe here are please um, this is something really cool that Barbara worked on uh, it is um, just highlighting some cool projects going on around Miami County this is the Arcola Lakes pollinator garden here, um, plans that we installed at Arcola Lakes. And uh, we also did a bioswale there. We got a huge grant from the National Parks and Recreation Association of America. And um, basically to install um, water soaking features in our most prone areas of Miami-Dade County. Um, and Little Haiti was one of those areas where Arcola Lakes Park is. Um, there have been reports of literal human feces on the streets from you know septic failure. So that's that's unacceptable in Miami-Dade County, in my opinion. So, um, you know, it's it's water soaking green features like these that help reduce these issues in the um, you know the modern world. And these are just showing some pictures showing the bioswale um, half completed here. You see they're filling it in with some porous stone there, so the water can percolate through. And you can see it's pretty attractive as well, pretty attractive and. And we had a really cool event out there for the bioswale installation. It was a pollinator garden installation, which Barbara completely designed, and you can see it up there. And we even recycled some plastics in the making of that. We used an old kayak, I believe she got from A.D. Barnes Park. So really cool stuff. So the future, and I'm just going to talk quickly about this before we close it up. Uh, the future of Florida, I believe, to help preserve water quality is not only education, um, but also low impact development. And um, these, there's some things you can do at your own home. You know, if you have non-permeable surfaces, like a, like a driveway that's um, fully paved, you can maybe, uh, I don't want to tell you to tear your driveway up, but maybe tear your driveway up, right? And install some permeable surfaces. And um, so things that the water's not going to run off of and into our storm drains is the idea. Um, Bioretention basins or rain gardens, we've talked about that, right? Also installing green roofs. And this is a big one because it helps reduce um, problems with first of all it'll reduce you money on your cooling costs because um, your roof isn't going to be a thousand degrees in the summer but also it helps uh, reduce the urban heat island effect which if you don't know what that is um, go to Miami Gardens I believe it is where it's all over the place um, Hialeah maybe um, I, I'm, I'm new to South Florida but wherever they I mean it's all over they, they like to concrete everything here in Miami um, so it helps reduce that urban island effect which is basically there's no green spaces so there's so much concrete, so much reflected heat that these areas can be 10 to 20 degrees hotter than uh, other areas. And then rain barrels are cisterns. Basically, a cistern is a giant rain barrel. 
And we have these actually implemented in Miami-Dade County. There's uh, different places that use giant cisterns to capture rainwater and um, reuse it in the, in the landscape. And also uh, subsurface detention or retention. This is basically kind of like an, um, water soaking features that can be held underground, uh, retaining that water, allowing it to percolate off. Um, and also implementing this cluster design, which is what I've showed here. This could be the future of what a development will look like, right? Um, and I just wanted to highlight a few of these. Homes clustered, allowing um, native vegetation retention. So the homes are maybe a little bit closer together. You can see that there are also some shared sidewalks, shared driveways. So maybe not only could this be a shared driveway, maybe it could be a shared permeable surface, right? So instead of having two separate driveways, maybe you can start sharing driveways, right? Maybe be friends with your neighbor a little more. Um, and all kinds of things, you know, reduce roadway, even just shortening the uh, width of the roadway can do a huge difference, right? Um, I read a figure one time that said a one square foot of, of road can kill thousands of square feet of, of mycological fungi, things that form uh, beneficial interactions with plants and things like that. So I encourage you guys to all stay connected. I've included um, a sign-up sheet on the back. Uh, we, I send out a, a, a monthly newsletter that links you to upcoming events, registration for these events, things like that, like our rain barrel workshop. We also have a composting workshop that happens at the Pinecrest Library right over there once a month. And if you attend that, you actually get a free composter, completely free, um, from the Miami-Dade Solid Waste Department. Um, so if you want to get signed up for that newsletter, as well as talks like this and um, other events, we do outreach events. So if you want to get signed up for that, I, I have a sign up sheet in the back there. You can sign your email. And if um, I, I ask if all of you can please share your email, because I actually have some stuff I need to send you regarding like surveys and things like that to see how I did. But if you would like to get signed up for um, our newsletter, you can just check this section there if you would like the newsletter and I'll put you on the newsletter list. And I promise I won't put you on the newsletter list if you don't want to be on it. Um, and also, I encourage you guys to follow us on social media. We post um, these events as well on social media. And sometimes we do recordings that we post on YouTube. Um, I don't know if anyone here, I believe he's also a member, is Jeff Wazaluski. Wazaluski. He is a member of the, um, well, he's our tropical fruit agent at um, Extension Office. And he does something called Tropical Fruit Tuesdays, where if you have tropical fruit trees, it will tell you all about how to fertilize, prune, and he gets very specific. Some of them are specific um, types of fruits, things like that. So if you want to check out those videos, go on our YouTube extension. And I can send this out to you. If you sign up for the new, um, if you give me your email, I can send you these um, in, you know, clickable links format. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. And I just want to thank you all for listening. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> I think mostly from co workers. Uh, so, so, Barbara says that the, the only stormwater ponds that, that uh, don't have plants around them are the ones that are emitting more carbon than right. uh, sequestered. Right. So it seems plants are, are a big component. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and if anyone didn't hear that, um, he was saying that those um, carbon, that, that figure I showed you about um, Florida storm retention lakes not, I mean, releasing more carbon than they're storing. Um, if you have a riparian buffer, you know, you've got a vegetated area around that body of water, then they can actually store more carbon than not. And, and they get better over time, but especially the newer lakes have a huge problem with emitting carbon. So that's just some little tidbits of info. Anything else? I think, uh, I think Barbara's presentation for Native Plant Society. So, so it wasn't with the, uh, with the data chapter specifically, she gave it to the Oh, okay. Oh, I see, I see, awesome. Yeah, and I, I definitely recommend it if you have, you know, maybe an area in your landscape that is prone to pooling, like water pooling up is probably because it's low elevation, um, maybe a, just a, a depressed area in your landscape. It's, um, not only will it help Barbara's monthly reporting numbers, but it'll also help you gain the knowledge to uh, implement one in your own landscape. And she also gives you some plant recommendations as well in there. Yes, yes. Um, so we have, uh, there's obviously way more people in our program than just me and Barbara. My boss, uh, Laura Vasquez, is the urban horticulture agent. Uh, so you can send samples to her attention. Or we also have a uh, master gardener coordinator in our program named Veronica Charpentier. 
um, who just joined us not too long ago, and she is great, and she's learning every day. So um, honestly, if you guys send me a sample, I'll probably sit down and look at it with Veronica nine times out of ten. So. And then our last oh, and Master Gardeners do this as well. Sorry, yeah, Barbara, I should mention that as well. So um, the free compost barrel, you sign up for it, I believe on the Pinecrest website, you just go there. And then I think on the homepage, there's like a little scroll down events menu. You go on the Pinecrest library, you can just go on Google and, and look up Pinecrest library branch and uh, click on their website on their homepage. You can scroll down on their events and it's called uh, composting at home 101. You click on that link and I think you can either register from there. And if not, then you call or register. And all you have to do is attend the class and you receive a voucher for composting bins. Um, there has been a bit of a backup on the availability of these bins um, because of you know, issues with the supply chain and COVID. Um, but I, I, last I heard that they, they were able to get some barrels in and everyone who's attended the class still is eligible for a, a composting barrel. Um, so they're gonna get theirs and also they're gonna start re-implementing the class now. And actually I went in there because I thought this was gonna be in there and I saw that it was advertised in there. So if you want to learn more, there's a big old advertisement, sorry, on, on there, uh, like right next to the main desk. You can't miss it. And that's, that's pretty much it. You got a few back. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions in the audience that I can address? Oh, thank you. I know. And, uh, yeah right right i know and it's sad mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes and that's a huge one um so if you didn't know you, yeah and if, if you don't know you, you're not supposed to recycle plastic bags they actually get stuck in the in the processing machines and i actually have a whole presentation i do on proper i, I call it compost it recycle it or trash it and i end it with a game of uh Jeopardy, where we go through and look at different things and then you decide, do I compost it? Do I recycle it? Do I trash it? And it's specific here to Miami-Dade County. So maybe um, if you guys want to have me back or maybe one of my coworkers, I can show them the presentation. And I mean, it's, it's really informative. So, but it also you can go online to the Miami-Dade County website and um, they have guidelines to recycling, what to recycle, what not to recycle. And yeah, I mean, 90% of what we've thrown away could have been recycled or composted. So Imagine if, you know, Mount Trashmore over there was 90% of the size it is today. It, uh, we'd have a, a lot less issues associated with it, that's for sure. Yeah, I've heard that they do burn trash um, and harvest it for energy. Um, I, I, I should do some more research regarding that as it pertains to Miami-Dade County. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, I don't know how they, you know, filter the gas and things like that associated with it. But the only issues I could see associated with that is, you know, burning trash could be toxic. Um, I don't know if they, you know, filter that out, things like that. But yeah, and you know that that could be the future. And hopefully, and it's it's up to our lawmakers. You know, uh, Barbara told me something. Um, to help me prepare for this. She was saying like, you know, the Dutch and the Chinese, they're, they're you know, leaps and bounds ahead of us as in terms of, you know, uh, preparing for the climate change in the future. You know, the Dutch are building barricades and the Chinese have these sponge cities where they're implementing these green infrastructure all over their cities to help soak up this rainwater. Um, so, you know, we're, we're honestly behind in Miami County, it's better than where I'm from. Where I'm from in, is central Florida, uh, my, I mean, Marion County. Um, so, you know, our, I think our lawmakers have a little more precedence in this in these issues because, you know, they're so close to home here. They're going to affect us way before they affect Central Florida. So we do have a little bit of help, but I still think the overall knowledge behind these issues is lacking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, so if you're harvesting rainwater, um, usually uh, in, in the in Barbara's rain barrel presentation, she talks about how you can redirect your gutter, uh, your downspout from your gutter into a rain barrel. 
Um, we don't recommend using rainwater harvested off the roof to water edibles because there can be issues with fecal matter on the roof, birds, poop, things like that. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Iguanas, right, right. All kinds of, yeah, I don't even, I, I don't even think of those things here in Miami-Dade, right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we don't recommend against it. <laughs> we recommend against it, I mean. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah the the swales right yeah, in the, in the mm -hmm. yeah i saw that yeah but, mm. yeah yeah Yeah, me either. The water quality came in the home. Sulfuric? No, no, not sulfur. I mean, they did all the bad things to the farm because then a lot of the nutrition got into when they broke the crops, the sediment, all kinds of things. Everything was clear, but then what I noticed was Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. Right. Mm -hmm. The bay. Right. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. And you know, I could, I could do a whole presentation about the issues surrounding plastics. I mean, I think plastics are the next major ec like ecological issue that we're gonna have to tackle. Um, I recently did a beach cleanup actually last week with um, the, the uh, National Park Service down in Biscayne National Park. We went to uh, Doozy Beach and we cleaned up about 20 feet of shoreline and we picked up about 600 pounds of plastic and 20 feet of shoreline. Um, Miami-Dade County has an interesting uh, juxtaposition, you know, with the Gulf Stream. Uh, you know, the Gulf Stream is a global, uh, global stream of water. And here in Miami-Dade County, it actually gets closer to any landmass than it does anywhere else around the world, I believe. Um, and it's right up here in the Biscayne Bay. So actually, when we're picking up trash out there, I'm finding uh, Chinese food wrappers, you Russian medical cans and all kinds of stuff, uh, you know, we filled trash cans full of it. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't know plastics are actually made most plastics are actually made with ethanol. Um, so they are actually a product of producing plastic is, is gasoline. So, um, right. Yeah. Mm, sad. I read another study um, recently that said that microplastics have been found basically everywhere in the world, even in the most remote island system, the Maldives, they've been found, microplastics have been found there in their water system. 
And they've even been found um, in the womb of an unborn child. They found microplastics present. So my plastics and the issues associated with them are going to haunt us for years and years and years to come. And enough plastic has been made in the world to completely surround the whole planet in a film of plastic, which is crazy. So, yeah. These are issues for our children and our children's children's children. So, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.